So my pleasure to introduce our esteemed guest to the stage. David Brooks is regarded as one of the nation's leading writers and commentators, an op-ed columnist with the New York Times. He is a regular guest commentator on PBS NewsHour, NPR's All Things Considered, and NBC's Meet the Press. His new book, How to Know a Person, The Art of Seeing Others and Being Deeply Seen, is the latest in a collection of five best-selling books, including Bobo's in Paradise, On Paradise Drive, The Social Animal, The Road to Character, and The Second Mountain. How to Know a Person is an honest and personal guide to fostering meaningful connections in every aspect of our lives. And for our Philadelphia audience, I have to let you know, if you don't already know that, Mr. Brooks grew up on the main line. He went to Radnor High School. <laughs> he's, a, he's a local boy, <laughs> local talent, and we're really happy to have him back in town tonight. So please join me in welcoming David Brooks. Thank you. I'm not tall enough for this podium. Is Kobe Bryant used to speak here? Is that what's going on here? <laughs> uh, it's a pleasure to be back here and um, to be back in Philadelphia, my somewhat hometown. You're going to shorten, if you could give me taller heels on my boots, yeah, yeah. that might work. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm going to try to offer you, um, we'll talk a little politics at the end, but mostly I'm going to try to offer you a array of uplift in a dark and uh, confusing and hard time. Uh, so I'm fir first going to tar start talking about the subject that I know best, which is myself. Um, and so uh, some of you may remember that movie, Fiddler on the Roof, uh, and you know from that movie how warm and huggy Jewish families can be. They're always singing and dancing and frolicking around. Uh, I came from the other kind of Jewish family. <laughs> and so the phrase in our home was, think Yiddish, act British. Uh, and so we were sort of unemotional, stiff upper lip types. And then uh, in nursery school when I was four, my the teacher apparently told my parents, David doesn't play with the other kids, he just observes them. <laughs> Which I guess is good for a career in journalism. I always say that if, yeah, I tell journalism students, if you're at a football game and everybody else is doing the wave and you just sit there and don't do the wave, you have the right kind of aloof personality style to become a journalist because we just watch things. And then uh, when I was 17 at Radnor, uh, I wanted to date, uh, oh, when I was seven, I uh, read a book called Paddings in the Bear and decided at that moment I wanted to become a writer. And I've pretty much been writing every day since. Uh, my Fitbit used to tell me, when I write between seven and noon, and my Fitbit used to tell me I was napping. <laughs> but I was doing what God put me on this earth to do, so I, my heart rate apparently went down. And then when I was 17 at Radnor, I wanted to date this woman named Bernice, and she didn't want to date me, she wanted to date some other guy. And I remember thinking, what is she thinking? I write way better than that guy. <laughs> and so. Those were my values. Um, and then when I was 18, uh, the admissions, admissions officers at Columbia, Wesleyan, and Brown decided I should go to the University of Chicago. Uh, <laughs> and so that was an extremely cerebral place, the famous saying about Chicago, it's where fun goes to die. Uh, my favorite saying about Chicago, it's a Baptist school where atheist professors teach Jewish students St. Thomas Aquinas. Uh, and so we were very much up in our head, and I fit right in. I had a double major at Chicago in history and celibacy. Um, <laughs> and we actually, freshman year, we uh, took my roommate, who had never boxed a day in his life, and entered him to go the Golden Gloves competition. And we gave him a nickname, the Kosher Killer. Uh, and then we, uh, we practiced the Chicago way, which is we didn't practice boxing, we read a lot of books about boxing. Uh, and his illustrious career lasted 29 seconds. Um, and so I was pretty intellectual. Uh, and then I went into journalism, which is a little bit of a detached profession where you're, you're uh, observing people and judging them. I was hired as a conservative columnist at the New York Times, a job I likened to being the chief rabbi at Mecca. Uh, not a lot of company there. Uh, and then I got a job in TV. Uh, but I got a job in the most cerebral form of TV, which is the PBS NewsHour, where we have, for TV, extremely long 14-minute conversations about things. Uh, and I love our audience. Uh, it's a somewhat seasoned audience. 
And so if a 93-year-old lady comes up to me at the airport, I know what she's going to say. I don't watch your program, but my mother loves it. And so, uh, um, and, um, and so all this is to say I was up in my head a lot. And there's a moment from about 10 years ago that symbolizes for me that way of living. So I love baseball. I've gone to hundreds, maybe thousands of baseball games. I've never caught a foul ball. And so, but I'm in Camden Yards in Baltimore with my youngest son, and a batter loses control of the bat, it flips up in the air, and it lands on my lap. And so getting a bat is a thousand times better than getting a ball. <laughs> and so a normal human being stands up, holds his trophy in the air, jumps up and down, high fives everybody, hugs, gets on the jumbotron. I take the bat, put it on the ground, and just sit staring straight ahead <laughs> with no emotion on my face. And so I look back on that, uh, and I think, show a little joy, man, show a little joy. But that wasn't who I was. But I do, if I'm not an exceptional person, but I am a grower, I try to grow. Uh, and so, you know, parenting was sort of an emotional revolution. I had some public failures and humiliations. Uh, and I learned about emotion by, I wrote a book called The Social Animal, uh, to learn about emotion, which is a book about emotion, classic University of Chicago trick to try to learn about emotion by writing a book about emotion. <laughs> and I think I opened up my heart. And the th sad thing was, as I opened up my heart, I became more open to music and dance uh, and the arts. And I discovered, unfortunately, my heart is 14 years old, perpetually. I like whatever songs 14-year-olds are listening to at any given moment. And so, Katy Perry, I Kissed a Girl, Avril Lavigne, complicated, every song in the Taylor Swift songbook. I don't even remember high school. I have listened to so many songs at high school breakups. It's as if I was reincarnated and I came back as Britney Spears. Um, and so I did get a little more emotion. I can prove it to you, though I have to name drop. So I've been interviewed twice in my life by Oprah, in 2014 and in 2019. And after the second interview, she says to me, uh, I've rarely seen somebody change so much you were so emotionally blocked before. And that was like a good moment for me. And she should know, she's Oprah, right? Um, <laughs> and the weird thing is, and the sad thing for our country, is that I was, as I was making a journey toward becoming more fully human, the country was making a journey to becoming less human and more dehumanized. And there are all sorts of statistics, I won't recite them all, but we all know the suicide is up by 30%, depression rates are skyrocketing, 36% of Americans report feeling lonely frequently. 45% of teenagers say they feel despondent and hopeless most of the time. The number of people who, have no, who say they have no close personal friends has gone up by four times. 36% more Americans are not in a romantic relationship. Uh, the number of people, Americans, who rate themselves in the lowest happiness category has gone up by 50%. And so what I see in my career is an epidemic of blindness of people not feeling seen, valued, and heard. And when you feel yourself not seen, you regard that as an insult, which it is, and an injustice, which it is. And so you lash out. And so a society that becomes more sad eventually becomes more mean. And so I was at a, a, a restaurant in New York, and the owner told me he has to kick people out of the restaurant uh, every week now for rude behavior. Never used to happen. Uh, my sister-in-law is a nurse, a head nurse at a hospital in Camden, and apparently her main challenge is keeping nurses because the patients have become so abusive, the nurses want to leave their profession. And so that's just sadness and meanness. Uh, and so why is all this happening? Well, I could tell a bunch of stories. One of them would be the technology story, social media is driving us crazy. One would be a sociology story, we're not as involved in civic life as we used to be. One would be an economic story. There's more in income inequality than there used to be. And so we leave disparate lives. But the story I emphasize is the most direct, which is we become sadder and meaner because we don't treat our, each other with the consideration that we deserve. And treating each other with consideration and reserve, we deserve is partly a matter of just being open-hearted toward each other. But it's crucially a matter of skills. To be a good friend, to be a good parent, to be a good teacher, to be a good colleague, requires certain social skills. How do you be a good listener? How do you reveal vulnerability in an appropriate place? 
How do you offer criticism in a way that's caring? How do you disagree well? How do you sit with someone who's suffering? And so in my view, we don't teach these skills anymore, if we ever did. And so people are go awash in social ignorance. And so my book is simply an attempt to walk us through the skills it takes to, be, to know another human being and make them feel known, seen, and heard. And so I would ask you, how good are you at these skills? Well, I haven't met most of you, but I can tell you with great confidence, you're not as good as you think you are. <laughs> There's a guy at the University of Texas who studies this, and the average person, when they meet a stranger and start a conversation with them, they accurately understand what's going on in that person's head 20% of the time. With friends and family, it goes up to 35% of the time. Some people are pretty good, they're 55% of the time, and some people are 0% of the time, but think they're 100% of the time. <laughs> We're often strangers to each other. In any group of people, there are people who are diminishers and they're illuminators. The diminishers are not curious about other people. They stereotype, they ignore, they don't ask questions. I sometimes leave a party and I think, you know, that whole time nobody asked me a question. And I've come to recognize that my, some, my conclusion is that only about 30% of the people you meet are question askers. They persistently are curious about you. The other 70% are perfectly nice people. They're just not questioners. And those are diminishers. Illuminators, on the other hand, are people who are curious about you and make you feel special and lit up. And so there was a novelist who wrote about 100 years ago named Ian e. Foster. And his biographer said of him, to speak to him was to be seduced by an inverse charisma, a sense of being listened to with such intensity that you had to be your most honest, sharpest, and best self. Who wouldn't want to be able to bring out that, that in other people? There's a probably apocryphal story told about Jenny Jerome, who would later be, go on to become Winston Churchill's mom. And in the late 19th century, when she was a young woman, one night she was seated next to a dinner in London with William Gladstone, the Prime Minister of England. And she left that dinner thinking that Gladstone was the cleverest person in England. Then a couple weeks later, she's seated at a dinner next to Gladstone's great political rival, Benjamin Disraeli. And she left dinner with Disraeli thinking that she was the cleverest person in England. <laughs> and so it's good to be Gladstone. It's better to be Disraeli. Many of you probably know the vaunted research facility, Bell Labs. They had a bunch of researchers, and some of them were just more creative and innovative than others. And they wanted to know why. And so they checked out their IQs, they checked out their educational backgrounds, and they couldn't figure it out. It turned out the most creative researchers were in the habit of having breakfast or lunch every day with a guy named Harry Nyquist, who's an electrical engineer. And he got inside their problems, he got inside their head, he asked them the good questions, and he walked with them as they solved their problems. And so Harry Nyquist is an illuminator. And so how do you get better at being an illuminator? Well, the first thing, whether you're young or more seasoned, is you read, study the humanities. You study literature, plays, the arts. The humanities are the most, I tell young people, the humanities are the most practical thing you can major in because they teach you about other people. And if you can't understand other people, you'll be miserable and you'll make people around you miserable. Then there's a series of steps one should walk through to really get to know somebody well and make them feel respected. And that series of steps begins with the first gaze. You're just encountering somebody and you're looking at them. When we meet somebody, there's a series of unconscious questions going through our minds. Am I a priority to you? Am I a person to you? Will you respect me? And the answers to those questions are communicated in the eyes before any words come out of your mouth. I was in Waco, Texas uh, several years ago, and I was having lunch with a woman named LaRue Dorsey. And Mrs. Dorsey was a teacher most of her career, and she presented herself to me as this stern disciplinarian, sort of a drill sergeant type. And she told me, I loved my students enough to discipline them. And so we're sitting there, and I'm a little intimidated by her. She was a tough, tough lady. And in at the diner walks a mutual friend of ours named Jimmy Durrell, who's a pastor. He pastors the homeless. Uh, and he goes up to her, and he grabs her by the shoulders and shakes her way harder than you should shake a 93-year-old. <laughs> and he says, Mrs. Dorsey, Mrs. Dorsey, you're the best. You're the best. I love you. I love you. And that stern disciplinarian that I had been talking to turns into a bright, eye-shining nine-year-old girl. And so the moral of the story is greet people more like Jimmy and less like me. 
And that's partly because he's a warm, big personality. But partly the profound thing is this. Jimmy's a pastor, as I mentioned. And so when Jimmy greets anybody, he's greeting someone, anybody, made in the image of God. He's looking into the face of God. He's looking at somebody with the in, a soul of infinite value and dignity. He's looking at somebody so important that Jesus was willing to die for that person. Now, you could be Christian, Jewish, Muslim, Buddhist, atheist, agnostic, I don't care. But greeting each person you meet with that level of reverence and respect is a precondition for seeing them well. To know that each person you meet is not a problem to be solved. They're a mystery that you will never get to the bottom of. So it's that first gaze is so powerful. Attention is a moral act. The kind of attention we cast on the world determines the kind of person we are in the world. So that's the gaze. The second phase of getting to know someone is what I call accompaniment. Most of life is not having deep conversations with other people, it's just hanging out. It's picking up your kids at school or attending a meeting. Accompaniment is an other-centered way of being in normal course of life. We think of the pianist who accompanies a singer. The pianist is there paying attention to the singer, he's there to make her shine. And so we want to have that other-centered way of being. And sometimes it can be just as casual as hanging out. I have friends who say, we like our friends to be lingerable. When they come for dinner, we just want to linger with them. They're fun. That's a great quality of accompaniment. The second is play. When you're playing with someone, you don't have to have deep conversations, whether it's pickleball or uno or basketball or whatever. You're just, but when you're at play, you're, you're yourself. You're more natural. I have friends who I played basketball with, and you can imagine how good I am. Uh, <laughs> and we've never really had deep conversations, but we've had trash talk and high fives, and we pass the ball, and we really sort of know each other. I'm, you can see how powerful it was. When my kid, my oldest son, was about 14 or 12 months, I can't remember, um, he, woke up, he woke up at 4 in the morning every morning, and I played with him till 10 a.m. when I left. Uh, and I remember thinking one day, you know, I know him better than I've ever known anybody. And he's known me better than anybody's known me because I was so emotionally open in play. And no words had just crossed between us because he couldn't yet talk. And yet there was a, a deep bond between us. Sometimes accompaniment is just being present. It's just showing up at the right time. So I had a student uh, a couple years ago, two years ago, named Jillian Sawyer. And Jillian's uh, dad died of pancreatic cancer uh, while she was in college. And as he was dying, they talked about the fact that he would probably miss some of the big events of her life, like her wedding. And after college, she was a bridesmaid at a friend's wedding. And she went through the wedding. She watched the father give a toast to his daughter, a beautiful toast, the father of the bride. And then it came time for the father-daughter dance. And she just didn't want to sit through that. So she left the table and went to the restroom quietly just to have a cry. And when she came out of the restroom, all the people at her table and the adjacent table had gotten up and had, were just standing by the door of the restroom. And she wrote this in a paper uh, that she gave me permission to quote from. What I will remember forever is that no one said a word. Each person, including newer boyfriends who I knew less well, gave me a re reaffirming hug and headed back to their table. No one lingered or awkwardly tried to validate my grief. They were there for me, just for a moment, and it was exactly what I needed. That's a beautiful example of just the art of presence, just showing up for somebody. So that's the second phase. The third phase is conversation. You have to be really good conversationalists to get to know other people and to have the kind of encounters you want to have. And so how good are you at conversation? Well, again, I don't know you that well, but you're probably not as good as you think you are. <laughs> it's easy to have bad conversations. That's two people making statements at each other. That's a bad conversation. A good conversation goes somewhere. People say something and the other person says, yeah, that's good, let me build on that. And then build on that, build on that. And we started at one place, we ended up over here. I asked a bunch of conversation experts, what are some tips to become a better conversationalist? And they gave me a bunch, a few of which I'll repeat here. One, treat attention as an on-off switch, not a dimmer. It should be 100% attention or 0%, but not 60%. Two, be a loud listener. I have a buddy named Andy Crouch who lives in Swarthmore. And when you're talking to him, it's like talking to a Pentecostal church. He's like, amen, uh-huh, brother, brother, <laughs> preach that. <laughs> and I, I just love talking to that guy. 
Make them authors, not witnesses. When people tell you a story, they don't go into enough detail. And so if you say, well, where was your boss sitting when she said that to you? Suddenly they're narrating you a story. You want to get people into story mode. Even in journalism, I no longer ask people, what do you believe about this? You, I ask them, how did you come to believe that about this? That's a, they start telling me a story about some experience they had or some person who shaped their values. A much better conversation. Don't fear the pause. If we're in conversation and I make a comment that starts on my shoulder and goes to my fingertips, at what point have you stopped listening so you can start thinking what you're gonna say in response? Probably here. So let me talk to my fingertips and then pause and then you can have a thoughtful response. Don't be a topper. Topping is when you say something about how you're having problems with your teenage son and I say, I know exactly what you're going through, I'm having problems with my Tommy. It sounds like I'm trying to relate, but what I'm really doing is say, I don't really care about your problems, let me talk about my own. And so don't be a topper. Two final ones. Keep the gem statement in the center. When we have an argument, there's usually something deep down we agree upon. If my brother and I are arguing about our dad's health care, we both want what's best for our dad. And so if we could keep that point of agreement, the gem statement in the center, you save a relationship in the midst of an argument. And then the final one is find the disagreement under the disagreement. When we disagree about something like tax policy, there's probably some philosophical reason we see it differently. So let's explore what that is. It's a more fun way to have a conversation. Finally, the quality of your conversation depends on the quality of the questions you ask. And so we should get really good at asking great questions. Now kids are phenomenal at asking questions. I have a friend named Naomi Way who teaches seventh grade boys in New York how to be interviewers, how to ask questions. Her first day in class, she said, okay, you guys can ask me anything and I'll answer honestly. First question from a seventh grade boy, are you married? No. Second question, are you divorced? Yes. Third question, do you still love him? <laughs> Her eyes widen. <laughs> she says, yes. <laughs> Fourth question, does he know? Do your kids know? By now she's crying. <laughs> so kids are great questioners. And as adults, we get a little shy about it. Too shy, in my view. And so we want to get good at asking questions. And sometimes you're just getting to know someone. You're not going to ask some deep, profound question. I ask people sometimes, like, I always ask people where you're from or where'd you get your name or tell me some, your favorite unimportant thing about yourself. I learned from that question, an academic I revere watches a lot of trashy TV, but that's his favorite unimportant thing about him. <laughs> but you want the questions to be open-ended storytelling questions. So I read in a book called You're Not Listening by Keith Murphy about a focus group moderator who was hired by grocery stores to find out why people are coming into the grocery stores late at night. And she could have just said, tell me, uh, wh why do you go to grocery stores late at night to the focus group? Instead, she said, tell me about the last time you went to a grocery store after 11 p.m. And one lady who'd been quiet through the whole focus group said, well, I had smoked a joint and I, I wanted a menage a trois with me, Ben and Jerry. <laughs> uh, and so you got a little glimpse into her life. <laughs> um, once you get to know somebody, my favorite questions are ones that take them out of their daily experience and get them 30,000 feet looking at their life. And so it's like, what crossroads are you at? Most of us are in life, some life transition. What crossroads are you at? If this five years of your life is a chapter, what's the chapter about? Uh, what would you do if you weren't afraid? I had a friend who was being interviewed for a job and at the end of the interview, he, he said to the interviewer, what would you do if you weren't afraid? And the lady burst out crying because she wouldn't be doing HR at that company. <laughs> I asked my students at Yale, what would you do if you weren't afraid? And every year, two or three say, well, I wouldn't be at Yale. It's not the right school for me, but I need the prestige. And so fear governs all our lives to some degree. Peter Block, who writes about community, has some great questions, but you really have to know people to ask these ones. What's the no or refusal you keep postponing? What's the commitment you've made you no longer really believe in? What's the gift you hold in exile? What talent do you have that you're not using? These are deep questions. I once had a dinner party and my wife thought I was really pretentious, but it worked. I asked, how do your ancestors show up in your life? Because we've all been shaped by our ancestors and there was a Dutch family 
and they talked about their Dutch heritage. There was a black family, they talked about the African American experience, I've talked about Jewish heritage. And it was a great conversation, because we, we all knew we were affected by our heritages, but we didn't really, hadn't really pinned it down, so we had a, a great conversation talking about that. And so these are the easy parts of getting to know somebody under the normal circumstances of life. Now we happen to live in a time that's not normal. And so to have a graduate degree level of social connection with other people, you've got to be able to make that connection under, under favor, unfavorable circumstances. And so I had a friend um, that I mentioned all the mental health problems. I had a friend named Peter Marks, who we were friends since we were 11. Uh, and Peter uh, had this seemingly charmed life. He had a great wife, wonderful kids. He was an eye surgeon. But at age 57, uh, he got hit by a very severe recession, depression. And I thought I was well-educated, but I didn't know what depression was really. I learned that you can't understand depression by extrapolating from your moments of sadness. Depression is not like that. Uh, as Michael Gerson said, depression is a malfunction in the instrument people use to perceive reality. And so in the case of my friend, he had these vicious lying voices in his head saying, you're worthless, nobody would miss you if you're gone. And so I didn't quite understand how severe the despair and the pain really was. And so I made social m skill mistakes. And a lot of this was over COVID, we were talking by phone. And so I, in the beginning, I tried to give him ideas about how we could li make the depression lift. And so I said, well, you know, you used to do these service trips to Vietnam, why don't you do that again? And when you do that, I learned, all you're doing is showing the depressed person you don't get it. Because it's not ideas that the depressed person is missing. It's energy and a lot of other stuff. And then uh, the second mistake I made was to say, your life is so great. You know, appreciate what you have around you. And basically I was just telling him, you should be enjoying the things you're palpably not enjoying. And how better to make somebody feel even worse. And so I think I learned gradually over the time that a friend's job in that circumstance is just to acknowledge how much the situation sucks and to remind him, you'll be there, I'll be there forever, that I'm not going away from this. Uh, there's no abandonment here. Uh, and I wish I had um, sent him more text, little tuck, touches just through the day, uh, no response necessary. Victor Frankel in Man's Search for Meaning, when he would counsel people who were contemplating suicide, he said, life has not stopped expecting things of you. And it seems harsh to me, but he says it, it calls people to understand the, the effect they have on the world and the effect they can have on the world. Because in times like these, people who have been through some suffering have the credibility to talk to other people through this pro their own process of suffering. There's a great quote from Thornton Wilder, without your wound, where would your power be? It is your very remorse that makes your low voice tremble in the hearts of men. The very angels themselves cannot persuade the wretched and blundering children on earth as can one human being broken on the wheel of living. In love's service, only wounded soldiers can serve. And that's the power of it that a depressed person can have on the world uh, or someone who's been through this. Now, sadly, Peter succumbed to suicide uh, about a year and a half ago. And nothing I said, uh, there are things I sh said wrong, but nothing I could have said would have made any difference. The monster was just bigger than Peter and it was gonna be bigger than the rest of us. And so it was a hard, a hard lesson. So that's one kind of social skill that unfortunately has become necessary for so many people. How to sit through, sit with people who are going through depression, mental health issues, grief. The second kind of hard conversation that has become unfortunately necessary is conversations across ideological difference, across class difference, across racial difference, across any kind of difference. And these can sometimes be hard conversations. Uh, often when you're in these conversations, there's critique and there's blame, especially me. I walk into a room, I, I come associated with the New York Times, with Yale University. I come uh, pretty establishment elite credentials. And a lot of people on both left and right see me as part of the systems of oppression that keep them down. And so there's often criticism. And my instinct is to um, be defensive. Oh, I'm not the problem here, I'm one of the good guys. You don't understand the things I'm dealing with. 
but I've come to appreciate that our, in this world, my job, and I think all our jobs when we're, being, we're talking across difference, is to stand in the other person's standpoint. It's to ask the other person in three separate ways and three different kinds, what am I missing here? Tell me more about your point of view. Tell me more, tell me more, tell me more. And if you ask them three or four times in different ways, you'll be astonished how the third and fourth answer is deeper, richer, and more complicated than the first answer. So you learn a lot. But second, you show respect. You show respect from their point of view. And there's a great book called Crucial Conversations. And in that book, um, they say, in every conversation, respect is like air. When it's present, nobody notices. And when it's absent, it's all anybody can think about. And in any conversation, your conversation is happening on two different levels. What we're nominally talking about and the under conversation, which is the flow of emotion passing between us. With every comment I make, I'm either making you feel safer or less safe. I'm either showing you respect or not. I'm either showing you my motivations for telling you this or I'm not. And so it's to pay attention to that emotional conversation underneath. And these skills of, of from the first gaze to the conversation to hard conversations amid conflict, these to me are the essence of moral life. Sure, moral life is big things like reporting embezzlement in, at a workplace, telling the truth at a trial. But to me, the essence of morality is to be a genius at the close of hand. Iris Murdoch, the novelist and philosopher, said morality is ha something that happens in the minutia of day-to-day -day encounter. And our job, normally we see the world through self-serving eyes. Our job is to get the self out of the way and enter reality. And to, she says, cast a just and loving attention on the people around us. And that's how we prove who we are and how we show up in the world. Uh, and so I ask people now, tell me about times you feel seen. Uh, and some of my favorite ones are just little daily things, like there's some big epical moments, but people with glowing eyes will tell me about times they really felt seen. And so I had a guy tell me, well, my, second, my daughter in second grade uh, was having struggling in the year in her in class, and the teacher one day said to her, you know, you're really good at thinking before you speak. And that took, that one comment turned the girl's year around because it took that thing, that moment, which she thought was social awkwardness, her weakness, it turned it into a strength. And as she told me that, he told me that story, I thought of my own 11th grade teacher, Mrs. Doosnap at Radnor. I'm, I was making some smart ass comment at class, which is what I did. And she said, David, you're getting by on glibness, stop it. And on the one hand, I was humiliated. She called me out in front of the whole class. On the other hand, I thought, wow, she really knows me. Wow, I'm so honored. <laughs> A woman in her 30s told me a story about when she, was when she was 13, she had her first taste of alcohol and got so drunk she was just lying, she couldn't move on the front porch of her house. And her dad, who was a strict disciplinarian, loomed in the doorway and she thought he's gonna scream at me all the things that are already in my head. I'm bad, I'm bad, I'm bad. Instead, he just scooped her up, brought her inside, laid her on the sofa and said, there'll be no punishment here. You've just had an experience. And 25 years later, she remembered that moment as the time her dad really got her and knew she didn't need to be screamed at at that moment. And so these are long memories. There's a guy named R Rabbi Elliot Kukla who tells a story about a woman who has a brain injury and so sometimes she'll just fall to the ground. And she told him, I think people rush to help me up because they are so uncomfortable with seeing an adult lying on the floor. But what I really need is for someone to get down on the ground with me. And that's empathy. It's knowing not what makes me comfortable, what, we, what you need at that moment. And when people do that, that's also great times of great seeing. I'll give you a few examples, and these are a little more profound of what great seeing can do, because it's a creative act that changes relationships and in my view, changes societies. One of them, it's just handy to be able to see people well. Franklin Roosevelt in 1933, 34, something like that, uh, met a guy, came to his office named Lyndon Johnson, who was then a 28-year-old congressman. And after the meeting, FDR says to his aide, Harold Ickes, you know, Harold, that's the kind of uninhibited young pro I might have been as a young man if I hadn't gone to Harvard. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then FDR continued, in the next couple of generations, 
the balance of power in this country is going to shift to the South and West. And that kid, Lyndon Johnson, could well be our first Southwestern president. Pretty good. Some of you probably know the movie Goodwill Hunting. And in that movie, Matt Damon plays this math genius, Robin Williams plays this therapist, and Matt Damon goes through the movie eviscerating people with his wit, including Robin Williams' character. Williams pulls him out to a pond and gives him a version, of, a longer version of the following speech. You're a tough kid, I ask you about war. You probably throw Shakespeare at me, right? Once more into the breach, dear friends. But you've never been where, near one. You've never held your best friend's head in your lap and watched him gasp his last breath. I ask you about love, you probably quote me a sonnet. But you've never looked at a woman and been totally vulnerable, known someone who could level you with her eyes. I look at you, I don't see an intelligent, confident man. I see a cocky, scared, shitless kid. You're a genius, well, no one denies that. Personally, I don't care about all that. I can't learn anything from you that I can't read in some book. Unless you want to talk about you, sport who you are, then I'm fascinated. But you don't want to do that. You're terrified of what you might say. And so that little speech comes from great listening. In the first place, he's heard the, thing, the very thing the Matt Damon character is most desperate to hide, which is how terrified he is of life. And second, it's a great critique with care. He's saying there are two kinds of knowledge in the world. There's book knowledge, and then there's the personal wisdom you acquire by risking things emotionally and having experiences. You have book knowledge. You don't have the knowledge that really matters. And so he does that with unconditional love, and he points the Damon character in the direction he needs to go. It's just a beautiful example of wisdom. I read a story, a story in a, a book called Lost and Found by Catherine Schultz. And in that book, she describes her father as this cheerful, talkative, gregarious guy, a guy who had opinions on everything from infield fly rule to whether apple cobbler was better than apple crisp. He just sounds like a wonderful guy. Uh, and he aged. And as he got old and sick, suddenly he just stopped talking. And nobody could figure out why. And so the family visited him in the hospital in those final weeks. And she writes, I had always regarded my family as close. So it was startling to realize how much closer we get, how near we drew around his waning flame. And then one evening at the very end, he sat in the room and the family all went around the, the room and they all said the things they didn't want to leave unsaid. And Schultz writes, my father, mute but seemingly alert, looked from one face to another as we spoke, his brown eyes shining with tears. I had always hated to see him cry and seldom did, but for once I was grateful. It gave me hope for what may have been the last time in his life, and perhaps the most important, he understood. If nothing else, I knew that everywhere he looked that evening, he found himself where he'd always been with his family, the center of the circle, the source and subject of our abiding love. And so that was a guy who died well seen. And it's just profound for the people to be involved in that kind of experience. And if it's great to be seen, I can tell you it's also great to be the one who does the seeing. So once, about two years ago, I was sitting at my house in DC and I was reading a boring book at the dining room table, which is what I'm paid to do. Uh, and my wife opens the front door, which you can see from the dining room table, uh, and she pauses in the doorway. And the summer sun is streaming in behind her and she doesn't really notice I'm there because that's the kind of charisma I have. Um, and, but her, her eyes rest on a, um, an orchid that we keep on the table by the door. And she's just thinking about something. And I have this sensation wash across my mind, which is I know her, I really know her. I know her through and through. And if you had asked me at that moment what I knew about her, it wasn't the personality traits I would describe to a stranger or even what she was thinking. It was the ebbs and flow of her music, the harmony of her way of being, the incandescence of her personality, the moments of fierceness, the moments of insecurity. It was as if I wasn't seeing her for a brief moment I was seeing out from her. And when you really know someone, you, you see the world a little from their point of view. 
And if you had asked me what word I was to describe how I was looking at her, the only word in the English language I can think of is the word beholding. I was just beholding her, which is like just appreciation. And it was just a beautiful moment. I told an older couple this story recently, and they said, yeah, that's what we do with our grandkids. We just behold. And they say you can never really get to know a stranger. I think that's wrong. I think in examples in my life and in many of the lives of people I've spoken to, there have been moments when that profound act of seeing another person really does happen. And out of that, if we live in a dehumanizing age, then seeing another human being is the most practical and aggressively effective way to fight back a dehumanization. And we live at a time when people are not seeing each other. In this country and in the Middle East uh, and everywhere. And it's a brutalizing time to be here. And the natural urge is to cower in, close in, be protective. And I understand that urge. But the people I admire at this time are the defiant humanists who say, I will not be calloused over. I will not put up the barriers. I will not declare war on the others. I will be defiant enough to do the essential humanistic act, which is to try to understand your point of view, try to acknowledge you as a person worthy of respect and investigation and curiosity. And it's not naive to lead with respect. It's not naive to lead with trust. It's not naive to lead with curiosity. To me, it's the most practical and effective things we can do in a time of brutal dehumanization. Thank you very much. Thank you. No, the depression experience is an isolating experience. So just to show up for people is just tremendously powerful. Thank you. Mr. Brooks, uh, thank you for your wonderful presentation. I am a relatively young guy that uh, watches you every Friday night. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for helping our demographics. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Can I bring you around to our donors? I'd like to. <laughs> um, uh, a quick question. So um, I actually watched your uh, interview uh, about the book on PBS. That uh, was the last week. And uh, mm -hmm. I, uh, about the eye contact, uh, thing, uh, uh, the gaze. <laughs> I grew up, I was born in West Africa and I grew up in West Africa. Mm -hmm. And culturally, uh, I came to America, immigrated to America about 31 years ago. And uh, we were raised uh, in a different culture where eye contact was not uh, a part of the culture. Interesting. And, and so when I came to this country, uh, being a naturally shy person, uh, <laughs> it took me a while actually yeah. to understand, I mean, the importance of that I, I gave. And so America being a country with so many uh, different people from everywhere, I mean, when you meet someone uh, that uh, uh, has uh, his or her gaze uh, on, the, on an angle, I mean, how, how do we account for that? I mean, it, it's taken me a long time to understand it and I, I make it a, I make an effort uh, to, to establish eye contact nowadays, but yeah. uh, uh, I recognize that, uh, uh, that there are people that culturally are uncomfortable with that. So. Yeah. Well, first we should cut each other a little slack first for our cultural differences uh, and for uh, sometimes personality difference, people who are on the spectrum. If you look, if tr for them looking into somebody else's eyes is like touching a hot stove. There's just so much incoming that they, they just don't like, they, it's too much for them and that's just the way they're wired. Um, but second, these cultural differences, um, you know, uh, I have friends who've immigrated here and they said, when I first moved here, my cheeks hurt because I had to smile so much. <laughs> uh, and so, I, I, you know, these cultures, we have probably a more individualistic society than a West African society or Asian society. We're a pretty individualistic uh, group of people. Um, and so these cultural differences need to be accommodated for. But one of the things I admire most in people, there, there's this phrase social capital, which is how you build connection in society. And there are two versions of it. One is bonding and one is bridging. And so bonding is with people right around you, probably like you. But bridging is the more exciting, which is meeting people who are completely unlike you. 
and getting into their heads and seeing how their culture is different. And th you know, we evolved to be in bands of 150 people, sort of like ourselves. And now we live in these wonderfully diverse societies and our social skills are not adequate to the societies we now live in. But one of the joys is having social range. Uh, you know, I, for example, I don't know what country you're from, uh, Ghana, so I had a woman in my class. I had a, for some reason, yeah, we have a lot of Ghanaian students. Uh, I'll tell you two quick stories about Zara, who's from Ghana. Uh, the first is I was asking the students, um, what, do you, what, are you gonna, what are your goals after graduation? And my American students said, I want to be a lawyer, I want to be a banker, whatever, whatever. And Zara said, well, it's not totally up to me. My village was here and they helped me come here. So we're all going to talk about it together. And it was a more communal way of approaching. And then the second Zara story I'll tell you is I had a kid from a very fancy prep school named Harvard Westlake, which is out in LA. It's sort of like Exeter Andover type school. And he was a, a total bro. And he treated me like a total bro. And I kind of liked it. He was a wise ass. He'd say, Brooks, stop being a dick. You're name dropping again. <laughs> and <laughs> and I, I got a kick out of the kid. And, I, I, and about two thirds of the way through the class, Zara raised her hand and said, Prof Professor Brooks, we don't appreciate the way Alex is talking to you. And so I said, oh, let's stop the class. How many of you think Zara is right? And how many of you think Alex is right? And the vote was 24 to 1 on Zara's side. <laughs> and so there was some sense of dignity that she thought should be due. And I was very glad at that day to have her in my class. <laughs> 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 yeah. How do you get around that? What rocks in your head? Yeah. So uh, I would say this is a case where it's good to be pushy. Uh, and so there, I have a friend and a source in this book named Nicholas Epley, who's a social psychologist at the University of Chicago. And he commutes down to school every day. And he was on a commuter train. And he's, he knows, because he's a social psychologist, the thing that makes us happiest is having conversations with other human beings. And, but he's looking around the commuter train and everybody's on their screens with headphones in. And so he's a social psychologist. He pays people on the subsequent trips, $100 each to talk to a stranger. <laughs> and they all report back afterwards with the researchers that this ride talking to a stranger was a thousand times better than their normal ride just on their screens. And his conclusion is we badly underestimate how much people, how much will enjoy these conversations. We badly underestimate how deep people want to get. Uh, and so if you can break through, it actually pays off. And I'm, as I said, not the jokey or the, most, the social guy on earth. And I used to go on the plane with headphones in, even if there was no music, so my seatmate wouldn't talk to me. Uh, but now I talk to people. And you know, I talked to a guy a couple of weeks ago or months ago who was this big Trump supporter. He migrated this country from Russia from, at age seven. He built up a company selling t-shirts to uh, other parts of the world. And he made a fortune, lost a fortune, made a fortune, lost a fortune, had more marriages than I could count. And at the end of the ship, he's showing me his vacation. He's an 80 year old guy. He's surrounded by 20 year olds uh, on the back of a yacht. I don't know where these people came from, but <laughs> so he wasn't my cup of tea, but I remember that conversation. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and so I, I just find if you can break through that barrier, people will enjoy it. The final story I'll tell is a guy named Dan McAdams, who's a, a researcher at Northwestern. He studies how people tell their life stories. And so what he does is he brings people in, he asks them, tell me about your high points, your low points, your turning points, and the interviews take four hours. And he said half the people cry at some point, but then at the end he hands them a little check to compensate them for their time. And they, um, they push the check back, they say, I don't want to take money for, the, for this. This has been the best afternoon I've had in years. 
because no one has ever asked me the story. And as a journalist, I can tell you, if you approach somebody and say, tell me your story in a respectful way, no one ever says none of your damn business. They're thrilled to do it. Now, having said that, when my wife tells me to put away my phone, I get pissed off at her. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but it's probably a good practice. Um, hello, thank you again for all you've shared today and for your optimism and joy. And you've made it clear that, that you've made a lot of changes and you're really happy about those changes. And when I told my friends in my book group I was coming, you know, they were interested and said, he sure moved to the left lately. Now that's where they live. They're, they're happy about that. But my question of you is, has that change and all the changes you've made also been difficult? Yeah. Uh, good question. So the, the first, first on politics, um, my heroes are a guy named Edmund Burke, who's a classic conservative of the old school. And his key concept is epistemological modesty, that the world is really complicated. We should be careful about what we can know and so change should be gradual and incremental. And he was my hero at 25, he's my hero today. And my other hero is Alexander Hamilton. And Hamilton is a Puerto Rican hip hop star from New York. <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> uh, but no, his, his thesis is we should build a society in which poor boys and girls like him can rise and succeed. We should have social mobility. So those are my anchors. And I, those are still my anchors but in my view, the Republican Party has shifted so far in a different direction that it's not conservative to me. And on some issues, I probably have shifted to the left. Capitalism does not distribute its, what it produces as fairly as it ought to. Uh, race in America is a national crime. And so, you know, I've written columns for reparations recently, things like that, or at least within the last five years. And so that would be a shift over to the left. And I would say once you get out of the team mentality, it's wonderfully liberating to be able to think for yourself. And it used to be I was on a team. And now I'm on, there's a, a party in the 19th century called the Whig Party, which had Daniel Webster and Henry Clay and early on Abraham Lincoln. And they represent what I think is the best political party, the best political tradition in America. And now there are six of us, so. Uh, <laughs> I'm an, on no team anymore, but it's liberating. <laughs> and then as for um, the emotional, first of all, I haven't lost any friends because the Republicans I was super close to have all become never Trumpers. And it's weird that the people who have become Trumpers were people I didn't like anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't say that because I, I have a lot of friends who are Trump supporters and members of my family who I love. So I don't mean to be harshly judgmental, but it's just my crew all became never Trumpers. And then the final change I would say is um, I've I got a lot more emotions going on right now. <laughs> like when I was back at Radnor, I used to think, well, all these people are suffering, but I'm shallow. I'm happy with that. I'm, 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 I'm good. <laughs> and now I feel um, happy, like joyously happy sometimes and really sad and pained other times. And I think, man, emotions are very much a mixed blessing. Um, uh, but it's better to live that way than not. There's a novelist who I admire named Fred B Frederick Buechner. His dad died when he was nine and he never grieved. And then in middle age, he said, if you cut yourself off from the pain of life, you cut yourself off from the holy sources of life itself. And so he opened them up, himself up over the course of his adulthood and by the end, he was crying about his dad every day. And he said, what we want most is to someone to look in our face with full understanding and respect. And what we fear most is somebody to look into our face with full understanding and respect. And so he says, what you should do is you should tell your secrets from time to time. Because if you tell your secrets, you will not fall for the false version of yourself you're trying to sell to the world. And you'll make it easier for the other person to tell a few secrets of their own. And so that, that's the kind of trajectory and path of openness and deeper connection that I'm shooting for. Uh, thanks very much, David, for everything. And uh, I'm an older guy that likes watching you on Friday night. <laughs> um, the, uh, the, the basic question is, uh, when did you first realize you wanted to write this book and how long did it take you to do it? Yeah, so um, I'm on a four-year cycle 
I come back to the Philadelphia Free Library every four years. Uh, and I've been on that cycle for since 2000 or so. Uh, and so it just takes me a long time to acquire all the information. Uh, and you have to give yourself to permission to write badly. So if you look at the first 200 drafts of this book, they're pretty bad. <laughs> and so that takes me a while. And I think when I first uh, wanted to write this book uh, was how many people told me they felt invisible and unseen. And I was just, it came up again and again in interviews. And this was black people telling me that white people didn't understand the systemic injustices they face every day. It was rural people telling me they didn't feel seen by coastal elites. It was Republicans and Democrats looking at each other in blind incomprehension. Uh, it was lonely kids who had no one to see them well. It was people in broken marriages uh, who realized the person who should know them best had no clue. And it just seemed there was so much pain. And at about this time, I just wanted to get, be a deeper version of myself. And so I'm partly, it's for, hopefully for the society, but personal transformation and social transformation happen at the same time. And it's how we each show up in the world uh, is how we make a world. And so I wanted to be better myself. And so a lot of us writers, we're just working out our shit in public. <laughs> uh, and and uh, my favorite saying about writing is a writer, I'm a beggar who tells other beggar where he found bread. So if I read something or hear something that's useful to me, I love sharing it. Uh, and so that's the thing that gets me greatest joy is when I learn something, I write it down, I put it in a book, I talk about it, and I see other people writing it down. And that's, so I'm not so much a writer, I'm a teacher. I just convey the knowledge that I've heard. Uh, and it's, I must say, uh, it's been a horrible four years in many ways, but it's been so uplifting to be around people who are just phenomenal, good illuminators. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you.